The story begins as we see a band of red ogres attacking a town. The people cower in fear, and as the monsters approach, a dragon can be seen flying overhead. A man on the dragon's back chants, and hundreds of paper talismans descend onto the ogres. A talisman stops in front of each ogre, and there is a devastating chain of explosions that destroys even a part of the town. One of the ogres survive, but it gets eaten by the dragon with a single bite. We learn that this is the world's strongest exorcist, who sought to be the greatest, but his search for power led the imperial court to fear him, and in the end, they betrayed him, even sending his favorite disciple to oppose him. In his final moments, he wishes he was more cunning, casting a secret reincarnation spell and swearing to do things better in his next life. We then meet a boy named Seika in the middle of a magic circle. His father performs a ritual to examine his power, but none of the elemental stones light up, meaning he has no magical power, and his brother Gly mocks him for being an embarrassment. We learn that he was reborn into a new world, where magic is completely different from his past spiritual arts. Despite not having any mana, he senses great spiritual energy from his body. We see Seika as he gathers some leaves. Paper is too expensive, so he creates Shikigami from the leaves instead. The leaves transform, with some turning into mice, and the others into crows. His brother Gly suddenly approaches, asking what he is up to. His brother looks down at him, threatening to hit him, but Seika's crows defend him. Their older brother, Luft, rushes over and chases off the crows. Noticing that Seika is unarmed, he is a little suspicious, but takes Gly to get treated. We see that Seika is learning about his new world on his own. He is the son of a mistress, which gives him lower status, so he is generally ignored at home. We see him working hard, as he makes his own paper, and is finally able to make his paper talisman. He gets a knock at the door, and we meet a young maid named Etha, who returns his coat, which his brother had thrown out. Gly saunters in to taunt them, telling Etha to get back to work, and bragging that he'll be going to the Imperial Magic Academy. As he is bragging, their father shows up, saying they need to get back to their training. Before they leave, Seika asks to join them. We see Luft as he casts his spell, creating a wind blade, and blasting through a large stone. Gly also shows off his magic, shooting a fireball at the target. Gly is proud of himself, and dares Seika to give it a try, believing that Seika has no power. Seika reluctantly takes the wand. On one hand, he doesn't want to reveal his power too soon, but on the other hand, he decides that a show of force might deter his brother from continuing to harass him. Using his spiritual arts, he fires a blue fireball, which completely destroys the target. The family is stunned at his power, and the fact he cast his spell without an incantation. Gly tries to take credit, saying it was his leftover power in the wand, but their father acknowledges Seika's abilities for the first time. Seika asks if he can also study magic, but his father refuses, saying it would be pointless, because there has never been a person born without magic that has become successful. However, he does give Seika a tutor, which gives him access to books, and Seika spends all his time trying to learn more about magic, even spying on his brother's lessons to keep up. As the years pass, Seika finally finishes his talisman. We learn that in his past, he would defeat demons and capture them, sealing them in another dimension to call upon later. He believes that even in this world, he would be able to summon his servants. As a test, he attempts to call on his most well-behaved demon. A door appears, and a young girl emerges. Seika doesn't quite recognize her, but the girl jumps on him, overjoyed to be reunited with him. The girl is introduced as Yuki, and she suggests that her appearance is different because his spiritual energy is lower than in the past. Seika is glad this was a success, and Yuki wonders how she can help him. Seika tells her it was just a test, and that she can't be seen by anyone else. Yuki transforms into a tiny wolf, saying she is sick of the other dimension, and insists on staying with him. The next day, we see Gly as he yells at Etha for spilling water on him but his tone changes, and he suggests that she can find a way to make it up to him. Seika comes to her rescue, saying he has business with Etha. His brother gets annoyed with him, trying to punch him, 
but Seika easily stops him and his brother storms away. Hitha thanks him and ends up leading him outside, showing him an injured bunny. She wonders if they could save it and Seika tells her to turn away so he can focus. He takes a hair from the creature and using his talisman, he successfully heals it. Hitha praises his talents and Seika can see that she is also special. Hitha gets nervous but Seika can tell that she can see the spirits of animals. Hearing that he can also see the spirits, Hitha reveals she can actually see the elemental spirits. But she finds it strange that those spirits seem to actively avoid him. He asks Hitha if she can command these spirits, and she remembers one time when the wind spirits were taking her laundry, but she yelled at them, and they seemed to go away. Having studied this ability in his past, Seika can see Etha's potential and offers to teach her about magic. Etha says she doesn't have the mana to use magic, but Seika tries to teach her by summoning a soul flame and telling her to banish it. She tries asking it nicely and has no luck, but she eventually loses her temper, insisting it disappear, and the flame vanishes. Although she is weak, Seika can see she will be a great ally in the future. They become friends and secretly train together from time to time. They continue to train over the next year, throughout all the seasons. On Seika's 12th birthday, there is no celebration as usual, and his father isn't even around. He tries not to let it bother him, and surprisingly his brothers approach him with wooden swords. Gly, as usual, reminds him of his unworthiness, and tells him his only option in life is to join the army. Luff clarifies, and says that they want to help him learn how to fight with a sword. Suddenly, the maids warn them that a monster is headed toward the house and their father is away. Seika can sense that it's coming, as we see in the forest, the head of a giant elder newt emerging. Dial runs off terrified, and Luff tells everyone to find safety, but Seika heads outside, and we see that the beast is locked onto Aoife. Seika rushes to help, but as the monster attacks, it gets repelled by a flame. Seika is impressed Aoife managed to command the flame, and he proceeds to lure the beast away from the house. It lunges at him, as everyone looks on in terror, but using his spiritual arts, he shoots a poison blast into its face. The beast falls, rendered completely disabled by the poison, and Seika prepares to tame it. Everyone is amazed at the feat, defeating the Elder Newt with a single attack, and they applaud his victory. He turns and waves, glad that his family finally seems to appreciate him, and he hopes that this will be the start of the life he had dreamed of. He has a feast thrown for him for the first time, and his father congratulates him on his accomplishment, saying that even veteran adventurers would have found the beast challenging to face. His father offers to reward him, so Seika asks him to allow him to study magic at the Royal Academy. His father thinks to how he always diligently studied magic on his own, and agrees with the request. However, his father warns him that even though they are nobles, he will still need to pass the entrance exam on his own merits. Seika goes on to request for Aoife to attend the academy as well as his attendant, wanting to keep her unique ability around. Aoife panics hearing this, but his father tells him it would be pointless because Aoife has no magic. So Seika decides to show off their training. He hands Aoife his wand, instructing her to command as many spirit flames as she can and pretend to cast flame note. She commands the flames, and follows his instruction, shooting an impressive blast. Gly is shocked she could use intermediate magic, and their father accepts Aoife going as well. Gly objects to his father's decision, saying it would be breaking tradition to send two brothers on the same path to the academy. His father agrees with this, and tells him he will be joining the Imperial Army instead, because he had always played with his sword instead of improving his magic over the years. Gly can't accept this, and challenges Seika to a duel, to see who gets to go to the academy. Their mother tries to stop them, but Seika accepts the duel, and their father decides their duel will take place in the morning. Back in his room, Yuki appears, commenting on the drama. There is a knock at the door, and he gets a visit from Luft. His brother wishes him a late birthday, and even gives him a gift. Because he always studied diligently, the gift is a glass pen. His brother goes on to apologize for being distant to him, but is glad he turned out into a fine young man. He asks him to take it easy on Gly during their duel and wishes him luck at the academy. Later that night, Seika's window gets blown open, and Gly demands for their duel. 
He couldn't wait for the morning and didn't want to follow their father's rules. He says that Sega just got lucky that a monster appeared and he lucked into defeating it. Gly attacks with his flame note, engulfing Sega in flames, showing he can also use intermediate magic, but it has no effect on him. Gly follows up with his wind lance, but it's stopped by a barrier. Seika takes out a paper talisman, and Gly continues to attack to no avail. Seika commands Gly not to move, and he becomes completely frozen. Seika scrunches the talisman's arm, causing Gly to feel the same pain. Gly is confused about his powers, and is ultimately forced to concede. He passes out, and Yuki wonders if it was wise to let him see his power and live, but Seika says he promised Luft he would go easy. Seika thinks back to Gly calling him lucky, but it turns out this was all a part of his plan. We see that six months earlier, Seika summoned a gigantic cyclops named Muto. Despite its appearance, it is glad to be able to serve him once again, and Yuki boasts that she was the first one that was summoned. Having researched the monsters in the area, Seika tasked the Cyclops to drive the Elder Newt out of the mountain. As he goes to pick up his brother, Yuki wonders why he doesn't show off his true powers, calling the people of this world weak. But he reminds her that it was the schemes of the weak that ended up getting him killed in his previous life, so he will not make the same mistake again. Sometime after, Seika and Aoife prepare to leave for the academy. Luff passes on their father's words, telling Seika to study hard, and Aoife to take care of him. The two leave, and along the way, Seika gives Aoife a necklace. She is overjoyed to receive it, and he tells her that they are mana stones which will help her draw in the elemental spirits. They are excited about their new adventure, but Seika starts to feel sick, getting struck with motion sickness, having trouble with carriages even in his past life. He starts to feel better, as they approach the Academy City, a fortress dedicated to pursuing magical excellence. Back at their home, his father sees that Seika should be arriving at the Academy soon. He thinks back to 12 years ago, when Seika first arrived. A woman showed up at his door, and disappeared after handing over her child. We learn that Seika is actually the son of his brother Gilbert, who became an adventurer after graduating from the Academy but they lost contact when his brother entered the Infernal Lands. Seika's black hair and eyes are rare in this country, and he started using magic when he was only one, causing Luff to distance himself from him and Gly to become hostile. After finding out he has no mana, he has always known that there was something strange about Seika. Knowing there is something within him that could either let him become a hero or become a lord of evil, he feels bad for sending Gly to the army but he felt it would be too risky to send Seika there. Instead, he decided to send Seika to the academy, in hopes it would be a better place to nurture him. Seika and Aoife arrive, and they get to their room. Aoife is surprised he actually has a weakness. Seika tells her that her room is next door, and she seems disappointed, suggesting that she should stay with him for the night, since he is her master now. Seika misinterprets this as staying for dinner, and says he has lost his appetite from the ride. Although disappointed, Aoife leaves to find him some food. Yuki bursts out annoyed, saying he has no clue about girls, and points out that Aoife is in love with him, even using her position as his slave to her advantage, and Seika is left in disbelief. Later, the two explore the city, but Seika senses a strange energy. They continue on to register for the entrance exam, and when Seika reveals he is from a noble family, everyone around takes notice. Aoife introduces herself as his slave, surprising the others. There is a magic tool that measures mana, and Aoife is shown to have an affinity with wind and fire. When it's Seika's turn, nothing happens, and the woman is confused. Seika reveals he has no mana, and the woman tells him he can still register. The other students start to gossip, saying he will get in because of his family. Aoife gets mad hearing this, accidentally leaking her flames. The gossip stops, as a girl confidently walks past. Seika notices something about her, and she introduces herself as Amu. As she places her hand on the device, it radiates with a blinding white light, meaning she has a strong affinity with all four elements. Everyone is amazed seeing this, and Seika calls to her. He thanks her for stopping the gossip, but she says she wasn't trying to help him, saying that she is actually annoyed by him, thinking he can get in without any magic and says he would just get in her way. But Seika recognizes her as his prized disciple from the other world. 
Although her appearance is a little different, he can tell that it's her. They take the entrance exam, and Aoife worries about how she did, but Seika tells her she can make it up during the practical exam. During the practical, the examiner explains that there are targets set up for each of the different elements, and their score is the total of all the targets that they hit. The students proceed to chant their spells and fire at the targets, but Seika is not impressed by their attempts. It comes to Aoife's turn, and she uses her flame note spell, creating an enormous flame, and even causing the flame-resistant target to burn. Everyone is shocked she used intermediate magic without an incantation. Aoife continues on to the next target, using her Wind Lance spell, which completely destroys the target. She apologizes for the damage, and she is still nervous about passing, but Seika is amazed that she used Wind Magic, and she tells him she has been practicing on her own so she could surprise him. Seeing her growth, Seika starts to tear up. Seika gets called up for his turn, and the others gossip about him having no mana. But Seika shoots his fireball, and they are shocked by his blue flame. Seika moves on to the Earth target. Using his knowledge and spiritual arts, he destroys the granite target by turning it into a crystal. The examiner panics, wondering what spell he just used, but Seika quickly moves on to the water target. Using one of his talismans, he uses his frozen arts, producing water, which he turns into a glacier. Everyone is left shocked, and Seika wonders if he overdid it. After the exam, the examiners are left in disbelief, especially since Aoife was measured to have weak magic, and Seika was meant to have no mana at all. They talk about all the exceptional students, and we see that Amu performed even better, completely destroying all six of the targets. They think that she could even be the hero that the legends say will appear when the Demon King is revived. A few days later, the results of the exam are posted, and Aoife worries about failing. Seika finds himself in third place, and he wonders who could have beaten him. It turns out Aoife is in second place, and Seika can't believe that she beat him. They see that Alma came first, and Aoife is impressed by her. A few days later, they get their acceptance letters, and they head to the academy for the welcome ceremony. Aoife worries they won't be together, because they are going to be in separate dorms, but Seika tells her not to worry. He suddenly gets a strange feeling, and he asks Aoife if she can see any spirits. Aoife reveals that there are a number of dark spirits, and Seika goes to investigate. They find a huge magic circle, and feel something is off, but since it could be the academies, they decide to leave it alone, but Seika leaves behind some of his talismans. Inside the academy hall, there is a feast for the students, and Seika can't help but grab some food. Amu starts to give a commencement speech as the student representative. But as she speaks, Seika has a feeling, as the magic circle is activated. He feels something approaching, and the doors are suddenly blown open, and there are some lesser demons that appear. The students panic and run. Seika sees that the demons seem to be looking for something. There are some that stay behind and fight, but Seika sees how weak they are. One of the demons approach, and Seika prepares to step in, but the demon gets cut, and Amu steps in. She uses her wind lance on the demon, and engages it in battle, but Seika notices something is off. He looks around the grounds using his talismans, and finds the caster by the circle. He warns Aoife to stay safe, and disappears, leaving only a talisman. Seika approaches the demon in the forest, trying to talk with it, but the demon calls him a fool for challenging him. He summons some more lesser demons, sending them to attack but Seika instantly crushes two of them, and even traps, and captures the third one. The demon is impressed, introducing himself as Gallius, the metal demon. Seika attacks using his talisman, but the demon destroys it. Seika is surprised it could see his invisible talismans, and tries it again with more talismans, but they also get blocked. The demon shoots out a blade, which Seika easily dodges, but it suddenly reappears, and he realizes the demon can teleport the blades. The demon can also shoot fire, and as Seika jumps to dodge, the demon appears behind him, cutting him, and he ends up losing one of his arms. Remembering that the demons were searching for something, Seika asks what he is after, and the demon reveals that he is looking for the hero. Seika says that the hero is just a legend, but the demon insists that it's real, saying that the years of peace have caused people to forget and just think of it as a legend. He reveals he received an oracle 12 years ago, 
and believes Amu to be the hero. The demon continues to attack with his blades, and Seika gets impaled, and the demon finishes him off. As the demon turns to head for the hall, Seika is revealed to be completely fine. The demon is confused how he is alive, and Seika gets stabbed in the head, but says he can just revive. The demon is determined to kill him, and then stop the hero before she becomes the strongest, but Seika laughs at what it means to be the strongest. The demon attacks, but Seika dodges and floods the area, creating a whirlpool, but the demon gets away using his teleportation. He reappears, and Seika opens a gate, summoning a thunder beast that strikes him with lightning. Having drenched the demon beforehand, Seika thinks the fight is over, but as the smoke clears, the demon is missing, and he suddenly gets stabbed from behind. But Seika says he is the one that caught him, and there is a huge explosion. Despite this, the demon survives, and starts to get back up, powering up, and says that Seika must be out of his talisman soon. But Seika reveals he has plenty to spare, saying he has been diligently making them for years. Deciding to bring things to an end, Seika opens the gate to one of his strongest servants, bringing out his dragon serpent. The demon is shocked to see such a beast, saying that even the demon king wouldn't have a dragon, as it rushes at him, and crushing him with a single bite. As Seika tries to call back the dragon, the dragon goes wild, and it tries to get away. Seika gets his talismans after it, and manages to herd it back and into its gate. Seika is surprised it rebelled against him, thinking it must be because of his weaker state in this body. Yuki suddenly appears, wondering if it was okay for him to use so many body double talismans, but he says it was necessary to work out the demon's attack patterns. Seika returns to the hall, and Itha is worried about him. Itha tells him that Amu ended up taking out all three of the lesser demons by herself, and the other students look at her shocked, but also concerned. Seeing their looks, Seika can tell that she will end up just like him in the past. He is determined to help her become the strongest, so he can sit back and enjoy his life instead. One month after the demon attack, the academy has calmed back down. Seika tries being friendly with Amu, but she acts cold toward him, and completely ignores him. As Seika and Itha are walking to class, there is a pot above them, that suddenly spills, but Seika manages to teleport out of the way. Professor Cordell apologizes for spilling the pot, explaining that it is a special mixture of monster blood and minerals that he is using for his research. He was trying to move it with his magic, but ended up spilling it. He apologizes once again, and heads on his way. Seika and Aoife get to their next class. Their professor tells them that the founding anniversary is coming up, so she needs the top two students, Amu and Aoife, to help out with a ritual. The professor explains that they need to take the new student roster to a temple in the forest and have it blessed. Seika thinks it could be dangerous, having fought the demon there. He asks what would happen if one of the students declined, and the professor tells him he would be next in line. Hearing this, he orders Aoife to give up her spot. The other students are shocked, but Seika says that such an important ritual shouldn't be carried out by a slave. After class, he apologizes to Aoife, and she realizes that he was trying to take the attention off of Amu, who people had started to resent after her performance against the demons. She wonders if Amu is his type, but Seika says he just wants to be her friend, since she is the strongest. Aoife gets jealous hearing this, saying that she can also become strong. But Seika tells her to imagine being so strong, that she is both praised and feared by everyone, saying that, that is what will happen to Amu. A few days later, Seika is handed the roster, and he heads off into the forest with Amu. Amu is suspicious of him, thinking he is trying to hit on her, even when he already has Aoife. Seika tells her it's all a misunderstanding, and he has nothing going on with Aoife. Amu's head suddenly hurts, and Seika notices a magic circle. They think it's strange, and it suddenly activates, transporting them into a dungeon. They are engaged by three lizard men, but Amu rushes at them, using her fireball, and taking them out in an instant. An ogre appears behind her, but Seika summons a wood pillar, and crushes its head. Amu finds his spell to be strange, but Seika plays it off as a spell he learned being a noble. They start exploring the dungeon, and Seika lights the way using his talismans. He leaves a trail, sticking talismans to the ceiling, and Yuki wonders what he is doing. 
He explains that he is leaving a trail so that his Shikigami on the surface can hopefully find him and help them get out of the dungeon. Yuki suddenly notices more monsters approaching. Amu charges at them once again, but as she fights, her head hurts, and she gets knocked out. Seika rushes to help her, using his wooden stakes to impale all the monsters, but there are just too many. Seeing that Amu is passed out, he summons a giant centipede, which is able to take out the rest of the monsters. When Amu wakes up, she is surprised all the monsters are dead. Her head hurts again, but feels better when Seika puts up a barrier. He tells her his barrier can block curses, and he wonders when she started getting the headaches. She says that it was ever since she enrolled at the academy, but doesn't think it's a curse because she hasn't noticed any marks. Seika says there are some places she can't see, which concerns her, but she ends up stripping down so he can check her body. They don't find any marks, but Seika says it could be hidden in other ways. Seeing as the barrier stops the effect, they can assume she is cursed. Alma wonders if she will have to stay in the barrier forever, but using a strand of her hair, Seika is able to create a substitute for her. The two get to know each other better, and Alma wonders about his relationship with Ifa, saying that she is in love with him, but Seika says they are just family, which Alma finds amusing, for a noble to call his slave his family. But Seika tells her how he was always treated like an outsider, and Ifa was the only one who treated him normally. Alma talks about her own family, but it seems to be a sensitive topic, so Seika asks her what she likes to do. She says that she likes to fight. She's loved fighting ever since she was young, but her parents found this weird, because most people would be scared of getting hurt or dying. She was even a part of a party that got wiped out, but she wanted more, and everyone thought there was something wrong with her. She came to the academy so that she could get stronger, hoping that if she became the strongest, fighting would get boring, and she could be more normal. But after fighting with the demons, she had too much fun, so she thinks there is something wrong with her. But Seika tells her she isn't weird, and she thanks him for letting her vent. Seika finds the exit to the dungeon, and the two continue on through the dungeon. They come to the boss room, and find a gigantic Naga monster. It spits acid out at Seika, but Amu distracts it with her wind lance, and Seika summons a metal spear to pin it down. Amu uses her fireball, causing a chain reaction and explosion. Amu takes the opening and stabs it in the head, finishing it off. After the battle, Amu hugs Seika, overjoyed they managed to take out a dungeon boss. They head to the treasure room, where they find a mithril sword, which Seika gives to Amu, and Seika gets a magical ring. The two finally manage to escape, and they report everything back to the professor. She didn't know there was a dungeon under the temple, and because the magic circle is gone, they aren't able to find the culprit. However, Seika pays a visit to Professor Cordell. After the demon attack and getting sent to the dungeon, Seika realized there must have been an inside man. The professor is surprised, thinking he had gotten rid of any evidence. Seika tells him to reveal his true form, but he is actually just a human working for the demons. Looking at his ritual, Seika calls him a genius. Cordell is proud of himself revealing it's a curse that uses light magic to kill its target from a distance under the guise of an illness. He starts gloating about how he will kill Amu with it, but Seika points out how he is protecting her. The curse is targeting those who were covered in demon blood, because Amu had killed all the demons, but Seika summons the demon that he captured, and covers himself with its blood. He becomes a target of the curse, but using a counter-curse technique from his past life, he is able to send the curse back to the professor, the professor feels the effects and starts bleeding out. Seika is actually impressed he developed a curse from scratch in this world, but as an exorcist, curses are his specialty. After the encounter, Yuki wonders how he knew the professor was the culprit, and it turns out that his Shikigami found pollen on him, which was only from flowers near the magic circle. Having solved this problem, he hopes he can finally get back to being a normal student. He gives Aoife the magic ring, which helps her with attracting the elemental spirits. He tries being friendly with Amu, but to his surprise, she still acts coldly towards him, but has somehow warmed up toward Aoife, and he is left confused about when they became friends. One year has passed, and things have been peaceful. The students are having another feast. Amu thanks Aoife for helping her with her studies over the year, and she is glad she gets to enjoy the food, since the demons interrupted last time. Seika watches over the school using his talismans just in case, 
but he suddenly gets approached by the vice principal. He gets told that he and Ifa need to see the principal. Amu jokes about him getting expelled, and Seika feels something is off. Ifa wonders what the principal is like, because the vice principal was the one running the school. As they enter the office, they find a small dwarf woman. She comments on how she thought he would be more cocky, and Seika is surprised a demi-human is the one running the academy. The principal is surprised by such a comment, causing her to remember a certain person. Seika wonders if she knows her father, but she was thinking about his uncle, who he found out was Seika's real father. The principal gets to the point, and tells him that she wants him to enter the capital sword fighting tournament. She calls in another student named Mabel, and tells them that their academy has been given two entries for the tournament. One will be for Mabel, and the other will either be for him or Aoife. Amu is shocked to hear the news, wondering why she wasn't asked. She wonders why they are participating in a sword fighting tournament, but Aoife tells her they changed the rules to allow magic this year. Amu still can't believe that she wasn't chosen, despite her skill with both magic and swordsmanship. Apparently, the principal just felt Seika was the right one for the job. Seika suggests that didn't want to put up anyone too strong, worrying about people trying to poach their students. In that case, Amu wonders why he was chosen, but Seika just calls himself average, although Amu can hear his BS. The three start talking about Mabel, and Amu suggests that she must be a noble, which got her spot thanks to her connections. As she is trash-talking, Mabel suddenly appears, suggesting that the reason why she wasn't chosen was simply because she is too weak. This gets Amu fired up. She borrows some practice swords from some students nearby, and challenges Mabel to a fight. As they prepare, Seika can see that Mabel is confident with the sword, and Aoife wonders if they should stop them. But Seika is interested to see how good Mabel is. The fight starts, as Alma rushes at Mabel. Her attack gets blocked, and Mabel goes on the offensive. Amu gets overpowered in an instant, and the fight is over. Mabel makes fun of her, calling her the hero, but Amu calls her out for using magic. Mabel tells her she is weak because she expects second chances, and she also warns Seika to withdraw from the tournament if he doesn't want to get hurt, saying it will be brutal. Seika thanks her for the warning, and she leaves. Aoife checks up on Amu, who seems to have suddenly made up her mind. Soon after, they're on a carriage headed to the capital. But Seika is confused about why Aoife and Amu are tagging along. Aoife says that she is coming as his servant, leaving Amu, who seems to have just snuck along. She says she has always wanted to visit the capital, but Seika can tell she just wants to see the tournament and see how Mabel fights. He wonders where she plans on staying, and she says she will be crashing with Aoife. Seika starts feeling sick from the carriage ride, and Mabel calls him weak. Amu tells her to respect her elders, but Mabel reveals she is actually the same age as them, even though she enrolled a year later. Aoife also reveals that she enrolled one year late, so she is actually a year older, and Amu makes sense of why she is so much more developed. Mabel is disappointed at the academy, saying that everyone acts like children, including Seika, but Seika points out that's because they are still children. They finally arrive in the capital, and Seika is sick from the ride. Mabel has already left, and Aoife suggests that he should go to the inn to rest, but Seika insists on going to the arena to check out the tournament bracket. He finds that if they both win, he will face Mabel in the semifinals. After checking out the bracket, Seika decides to go and rest at the inn. Aoife wants to accompany him, but he tells her to go explore the city. Amu suggests that he needs his special alone time, but he tells her not to be weird. After they leave, Seika prepares to find out why the principal insisted on choosing him for the tournament. The day of the tournament arrives, and the announcer talks about how the rules were changed to allow magic, and around half the participants are mages. The participants have a special amulet that absorbs damage for the fighters, but if it breaks, the match is over. Seika sees this as a way the tournament is trying to prevent casualties. Seika is introduced in the first match, and his opponent is an ex-noble mercenary nicknamed the Godspeed Bulldog. He is a pure swordsman, known for his impressive speed. He was expelled from his family for his bad behavior, so he considers himself lucky to have Seika as his opponent, since he has a grudge against nobles. The crowd gets excited to see how a fight between a mage and a swordsman will go, but the man looks down on mages, 
saying their spell take too long to cast. Seika mentions how he is still feeling unwell. The man thinks he is trying to make excuses, but Seika just means he plans to end things quickly. This angers the man, and the fight begins. And he instantly stabs Seika. But using his talisman, Seika gets behind him. He uses another spell, and instantly blows the man out of the ring. The fight is over, and Seika is declared the winner. The girls cheer for him, and the crowd is left wondering how things ended in a blink of an eye, while Seika thinks he might need to hold back a bit more in the future. When he is alone, Yuki appears, wondering how far he intends to go in the tournament, and warning against standing out too much. She also worries that he is using up a lot of his talismans, but he says it's a necessity, as he keeps watch over the two girls. As he joins the other two in the stands, the next round begins. We meet Burin, the prime disciple of a sage that is famous with using water magic, and his opponent Kyle, a guard for the Legrock merchants. Looking at his appearance, the crowd wonders how he will fight. When the match begins, as Burn prepares himself, he suddenly notices Kyle's glare. Seika realizes something is off and tries to get a better view. Kyle slowly approaches, as Burn stands completely frozen. Seika sees the fear in Burn's face, and Kyle just walks up and stabs him. Blood goes everywhere, and the crowd is shocked and confused. But despite the casualty, they all cheer for the spectacle, except for the trio. Seika gets a closer look at Kyle, and sees that he wields an evil eye, which gives him the ability to hex people with a single glance. Seika comes out for his second round, and his opponent is an enormous golem. It's enchanted with magical defenses, and its master gloats that it was specifically designed to fight against mages. She tells Seika he has no chance, and should just concede. But as the fight begins, Seika quickly summons one of his demons, which slashes right through the golem and disappears. For the spectators, it looked like Seika just used wind magic, and the woman is confused at what happened. Seika returns the favor, telling her she should concede, and he is declared the winner. After the match, Seika says it was a close one, but this is confusing to Yuki. Seika explains that summoners are banned, so if they noticed he summoned a demon, he would have been disqualified. As Seika returns to the stands, Aoife is worried for him. After seeing Kyle kill his opponent, she thinks Seika should just withdraw from the tournament. Seika assures her that he will be fine, and Alma comments on how quickly his fight ended, saying it's no fun to watch his fights. She wonders if he will join the Imperial Guard if he wins the tournament, but Seika says he intends to turn it down. Amu is relieved to hear this, although she tries not to show it. Seika says he isn't guaranteed to win, but Alma can't imagine him losing, while Aoife is still worried. The next match of round 2 begins, and it's Mabel's turn to fight. Her opponent is Haro, a highly skilled earth mage. When the fight begins, Haro attacks using his rock blast, but Mabel slices right through it. Haro is surprised, and continuously fires his rock blast, but Mabel is able to stop them all. Haro backs away and starts chanting to use his advanced magic. He summons a wall to protect himself, but Mabel throws knives and destroys the wall. Haro creates multiple walls, but Mabel knocks them down using her daggers. Alma wonders how she is doing it, and Seika thinks she must be using gravity magic to make her weapons heavier than the stones. She keeps destroying the walls, and Haru tries to counterattack, but Mabel charges at him and destroys his staff. Haru admits his defeat, and Mabel is declared the winner. The announcer calls Mabel the unstoppable hero, and Seika wonders why she is being called the hero. Amu tells him that Mabel was the name of the second hero, and she even uses the same weapon. But Seika comes to a realization. That night, we see a man sending off a carrier pigeon, but it gets intercepted, and Seika appears. He accuses the man of working for the devils, but the man pretends not to know what he is talking about. As he walks past, he tries to attack Seika, but he gets restrained by Seika's vines. Seika reveals he saw him talking with an information dealer, using one of his shikigami. Seika asks him about the message he was sending, but the man refuses, saying he will never talk, even if he was tortured. Seika summons one of his demons, Satori, and as the man looks at it, Satori is able to read the man's mind. Seika asks him questions, and we find out he is working for the devils. Seika guesses he is after the hero, and the man is surprised, because it should be a secret. Seika asks for the name of the hero he is after, 
and it turns out to be Mabel. Seika wonders why he thinks she is the hero, and it's because she matches the description given by their spy. But since Seika took out Cordell, they can no longer confirm. After learning all of this, he releases the man from his vines, but tells Satori he can eat him as a reward. The man is horrified, and gets devoured by the monster. Satori remarks that it had to be done, saying it's too dangerous to let him go, but he was actually reading Seika's mind, and Seika threatens him for doing so. Satori gets scared, and Seika opens his gate to send him back. Yuki appears, and Seika apologizes for scaring her. He calls over his raven, and checks the message from the pigeon, but it turns out to be encrypted, and he wishes he kept the guy alive. Seika works out the academy's plan, it was to send Mabel to win and draw all the attention as the false hero, so the devils can stop targeting Amu. Yuki is curious about Mabel's identity, and Seika suggests she must be using a fake name, although he doesn't care to investigate her further, since she is there to protect Amu. The next day, Kyle took out his opponent in the same way, thanks to his evil eye, and a boy named Reynas, who can use all four elements, also advances. Seika runs into Reynas, and he tells him he will see him in the finals. Everyone has been talking about him since he can use all four elements, and his opponent in the next round has already withdrawn. Seika goes up against a necromancer in the third round, but defeats him with ease, and Mabel easily wins as well. After her fight, Mabel confronts Seika, telling him he should withdraw before their fight in the semifinals, but Seika refuses. She acknowledges his strength, and warns him that she will have to go all out against him, but she doesn't want to end up killing him, but Seika still refuses to withdraw. There is a sudden announcement that Kyle's next opponent has withdrawn, so they decide to move up the semi-final match between Reynas and Kyle. As the fight begins, Reynas buffs himself with light magic to protect against the evil eye. Amu is surprised he can use light magic on top of the four elements. Reynas starts to gloat since he is immune to the evil eye, but Kyle slowly advances. Reynas shoots his fireball, but it seems to have no effect. He keeps attacking, using all his different elements, but Kyle is unfazed by the attacks, and continues to move forward. Seika thinks he must be using gravity magic, just like Mabel. Reynas starts to get desperate, and summons an army of golems to defend himself, but Kyle uses shadow magic, and destroys all of the golems in an instant. Reynas charges at him, but he is stopped as Kyle binds him with his shadow. As Kyle goes to finish him off, the refs call the fight, and Kyle is declared the winner, advancing to the finals. At night, Seika thinks about going back to the academy after the finals, and Yuki reminds him not to win. As he tries to sleep, Yuki suddenly transforms, saying she wants to sleep with him. Seika says they sleep together all the time, but Yuki says it has been ages since she took her human form. Seika gets a feeling, and notices Mabel on the roof. Thanks to the Shikigami, he jumps on Yuki, making her happy, but there is an explosion, and Mabel makes her entrance. Seika prepares for a fight, and Mabel throws her knives at him. She tackles him out of the window, but he manages to back away from her. He tries to bind her with his vine spell, but Mabel is able to defend herself. She charges at him, but Seika gets away using his body double talisman. Seika manages to hold her off, and he tries to talk to her. Mabel finds it strange he wants to talk after she just attacked him, but Seika can tell that she wasn't trying to kill him. She reveals she was just trying to break some of his bones so he would have to drop out of their fight. She is determined to get to the finals, and asks him to withdraw once again. Seika reveals that he knows she is a stand-in for Amu, suggesting that her mission is to win the tournament posing as the hero to draw the attention of the devils. Mabel is surprised at how much he knows but reveals that his information is off, revealing that her mission isn't to win the tournament, but it's to be killed by Kyle, so that the devils will think that the hero died. She reveals that both she and Kyle were trained by the Legrock merchants. The Legrock merchants take talented slave children and train them to become soldiers. She mentions that the merchants are testing Kyle to see if he has become a real soldier. Seika is curious about what she means, and Mabel reveals that when the merchants make a soldier, they do an operation where they open up the skull and engrave magic on the brain, causing the soldier to no longer feel any fear or doubt, making them perfectly obedient. The merchants train children in groups of four, living and training together, they are taught to rely and encourage each other. 
but eventually, only one is chosen to undergo the operation, and they are then tasked with killing their three friends as a final test to becoming a soldier. Since she was disposable, they decided to use her in this mission to deceive the devils, and she reveals that she is the final person that Kyle needs to kill. Although her mission is to die, Mabel plans to make it to the finals so that she can kill Kyle. She says that Kyle killed her brother, so she wants to get revenge. However, Seika sees through her lie, guessing that Kyle is actually her brother. He can tell that her hair is dyed, and that she has the same eyes as him. Seeing that he figured it out, Mabel says that before her brother's operation, he told her that if he became a different person after his surgery, then he wanted her to put him to rest. She can no longer recognize him as her brother, because her brother would never just kill without reason, so she plans to follow his instruction and put him to rest. Seika wonders if she can even beat him, but Mabel is determined to try no matter what, since she is probably going to end up dead regardless of the result, because the merchants would dispose of her. After hearing all of this, Seika decides that he will be the one to get to the finals and defeat Kyle. Mabel is surprised to hear this, and Seika says that she doesn't need to be the one to beat Kyle. Mabel says that it's already too late for her, suggesting that he doesn't understand because they are from different worlds. She has no idea what she would do, but Seika tells her she can just go back to the academy. She knows that the merchants would never allow that, but Seika promises that he can protect her. Mabel doesn't believe him, but Seika claims that he is the strongest there is. He suggests that if her brother had a final request, he would want his sister to be able to be free. Mabel thanks him, but swears to go all out to win against him. The next day, it's time for their semi-final match. Mabel wields a gigantic battle axe in this round, saying that she is done pretending to be the hero. Seika is excited to see her real power, but Mabel calls him a noble brat, saying he has no chance. The fight begins, and Mabel goes on the offensive. She slashes through the rubble, attacking Seika, but Seika avoids it thanks to his talisman. Seika is impressed at her speed, thinking she must use gravity magic to lighten her axe. He blasts her with some stones, but she swings out of the way. She throws daggers, infused with her gravity magic, but Seika easily blocks it. He counterattacks using his vines, but Mabel breaks free. However, her axe becomes too heavy, as Seika mentions he made it a thousand times heavier. He attacks with vines once again, but this time they are infused with mercury, making them much stronger. He grabs her axe, but Mabel tells him he won't be able to even lift it, but using one of his talismans, he makes it lighter and holds it up to her. The match is called, and Seika is declared the winner. Seika reassures her and tells her to leave Kyle to him. The finals are up next, and the fighters take their positions. Seika apologizes for disrupting their plans, but Kyle is just glad Mabel is alive so he can kill her later. Seika tries reasoning with him, but Kyle tells him to mind his own business. Their fight begins, but before Kyle can activate his eye, Seika summons a red mist that completely covers the field. Seika attacks with his flames, but it has no effect thanks to Kyle's gravity magic. Seika switches his tactic, summoning his mercury vines to restrain Kyle, but he is able to break free using his shadow magic. Kyle continues to approach, but Seika summons a gate, bringing forth a minotaur. Kyle attacks with his shadow, but it has no effect on the beast. The minotaur bats him away, and Seika suggests that if he could feel fear, he probably wouldn't have picked such a reckless fight. Seika plans to let him live, but he is suddenly afflicted by a curse. Seika sets up his barrier to block the curse, and the markings fade. However, he already took too much damage, and he coughs out blood. Kyle grabs onto him, and passes on his final message for Mabel. Annoyed that he lost to a curse, he refuses to lose. He activates his technique, and prepares to bring Kyle back from the dead. Yuki begs him to stop, saying the technique will draw too much attention, reminding him how things ended for him in his previous life, and Seika ends up cancelling his technique. After the match was over, Kyle is gone, but Seika explains that he completely vaporized him, and the officials believe him. He is declared the winner of the tournament, and he gets to keep the prize money. He had hid Kyle's body in his void, so he could let Mabel give him a proper burial. Mabel thanks him for his help, and Seika passes on Kyle's final message. He apologizes for breaking her clover, and we see that as kids, she had a hairpin that she loved, but he accidentally broke it. Mabel cries at the memory, and she says goodbye to her brother. Mabel wonders what will happen to her now, but Seika assures her she can just go back to the academy, 
and he will handle the rest. They explain everything to Amu and Aoife, although Seika leaves out the part about Mabel posing as the hero. Amu stops Mabel and demands a rematch, but Mabel isn't in the mood. However, Amu insists. They start their duel, but this time Amu uses magic, cutting right through Mabel's sword. She reveals that she can also use gravity magic now and tells her not to underestimate her. She says they are now even, and she is glad to have another sparring partner. Mabel is a bit confused, but they end up deciding to get along. They head back to the academy, and Seika meets with the principal. He reveals that he figured out their plan of using Mabel, but the principal reveals that she sent him to the tournament in order to save her. She pitied her, seeing how talented she was, so she came up with a way to make her lose without dying. She calls Seika her trump card, but Seika wonders what she would have done if he had lost. She says she has been around for a long time and has a way of telling how strong someone is. Seika wonders just how old she is, but she calls him rude. However, she says that she stopped counting after she turned 300. The principal guarantees Mabel's safety at the academy, but tells him to show her the ropes, since this is a completely different life for her. Later on, Seika meets up with the crew, and Mabel has changed her hair back to its original color. Mabel tries to sneak away, but Seika calls her out. Mabel finds him too strict as a tutor, but Seika tells her she needs to study because she hasn't been able to pass the entrance exam. Mabel is in tears, and she begs Aoife for help. But Aoife says that Seika is actually going easy on her, and this leaves her stunned. Summer break approaches, and Alma wonders how the others will be spending it. Seika says that he has been requested to investigate dragons in the country of Astelia. His father had been requested, but he is too busy, so Seika is being sent instead. Amu asks to tag along, but Seika reminds her that her parents are expecting her. Mabel says she has no plans, and also asks to join, but Seika tells her she needs to catch up on her studies. He asks Aoife to join him, and she quickly agrees. There are suddenly two people that enter the hall. They come up to Seika and introduce themselves as Cecilio, the first prince of Astelia, and his elven attendant Liz. Seika exchanges greetings, but Cecilio is soon drawn to Aoife. He immediately asks her to join his harem and become one of his wives. They are all shocked, and Aoife explains that she is Seika's servant. The prince asks to buy Aoife at a high price, and Seika is left stunned. Liz tells Cecilio he is making a scene, so they move to a private room to discuss. They start talking about the dragon investigation. According to the legends, the dragon was originally hatched from an egg by the royal family. Cecilio explains that the dragon is said to have lived alongside humans for over a century, but recently, it started to act strange, attacking fields and even livestock. So Cecilio tells Seika to look into what is going on. He then turns his attention to Aoife, but Liz reminds him to behave. After the meeting, Seika gets ambushed by Amu and Mabel, who want to know what is going on. They are worried about Aoife being handed over to the prince, but Seika thinks it could be a good opportunity for her if she is interested. They tell him that there is no way she would want that, and that he shouldn't even bring it up to her. But Seika is confused about this, not wanting to deny her this opportunity. Two days later, he and Aoife join the prince's caravan to Astelia, and Seika struggles on the ride. They talk about how they will get to see a real dragon, and Aoife mentions how the prince asked her to ride with him. She thinks he was just joking about her joining his harem, but seems a little flattered by it. Nine days later, they reach the capital of Astelia. They find the surrounding quite beautiful, but Cecilio mentions that the dragon has caused the people to live in fear, and trade has become difficult. The dragon flies overhead, and Seika notes the size of it. The dragon suddenly dives down at them, swooping right past them. We hear a spell being chanted, and an impressive lava tiger is summoned. It lunges at the dragon, narrowly missing it, and the dragon flies away. The tiger turns its attention to Aoife and charges at her, but Seika manages to stop it just in time, although the tiger starts to melt the surroundings. Seika rushes over, and he prepares to destroy the tiger, but it is suddenly restrained, and we meet Zek the summoner. He reprimands the tiger for running wild, and returns it back to his book. The prince comes running, and warns Zek that he almost harmed his guests, but Zek says he was just trying to chase off the dragon, saying that it's been getting even closer lately, and has started attacking people. Seika wonders what's his deal, and the prince explains that Zek is the head of some mercenaries that he hired. 
Zekt wonders how a kid like him can help with their problem, and Seika wonders why he hired mercenaries. The prince admits he is trying to hunt the dragon as a way to solve their problem. Seika tells him to reconsider, saying it would be impossible for the lava tiger to actually kill the dragon. Zekt says he doesn't know what he is talking about, claiming to have killed a number of dragons in the past. The two start to get heated, but the prince breaks them up. He sends Zekt away and reprimands Seika for provoking him. Seika apologizes, saying he lost his temper because Ethel was put in danger. He goes on to ask if hunting the dragon has been approved by the queen, since the dragon is the symbol of the country, but Cecilio claims that everything has been left up to his judgment, and he reminds Seika of his place. Seika turns to Aoife, and asks why she didn't defend herself with magic, but Aoife says she was scared and froze up. He reprimands her, saying he will not always be around, so she needs to be able to defend herself. He wonders if it was a mistake to bring her, and she starts to tear up. The prince tries to calm him down, saying it's natural to become scared in front of such a creature. Seika says that this is a matter between the two of them, and tells her that if she is not able to fight, then she must at least run or ask for help. As they return to their carriage, Seika feels bad for reprimanding her, but remembers back to a time when one of his friends froze up and ended up eaten by a dragon, so he doesn't want that to happen to Aoife. The next day, they head to the library to find out more on the dragons. Seika finds that something similar happened in the past. A few hundred years ago, the queen hatched the dragon from an egg and it lived alongside the people. Eventually another dragon arrived in Astelia, and they started living together in the mountains. But after 50 years, the dragons became more hostile, and it was because they had a baby. Ethel wonders what happened to the babies, and they were said to have left the nest after they became adults. After another 50 years, the female dragon died of old age, and this was all 100 years ago. Aoife thinks the situation is different, since it should just be one male dragon, so it can't be about protecting their young. Seika decides it would be best to just go up the mountain to see for himself. Aoife thinks it's too risky, but Seika is confident he can get away if he needs. Later that night, Aoife comes to his room. She tells him that the prince was asking for her, and she doesn't know what to do. Seika tells her she doesn't have to go, and invites her to stay in his room for the night. He offers the bed to her, but she says it's plenty for the both of them. They get to bed, and Seika wonders what she thinks about the prince. He wonders if she has considered his offer, saying she doesn't need to worry about him. Aoife thinks he is trying to get rid of her, apologizing for the previous day once again. Seika says that's not what he meant, and Aoife wonders why he is bringing this up. He says it could be a good opportunity for her, and Aoife wonders how he would feel if she left him. He says he would feel lonely, but he would be able to accept it. Aoife says she will consider it, although we see her in tears. In the morning, Aoife is already gone, and Yuki suddenly appears. She feels bad for Aoife, reminding him of how Aoife is in love with him. Seika thinks they are just childhood friends, but Yuki can tell she has always loved him. Seika confronts the prince about his advancements toward Aoife. He wonders why the prince is so drawn to her, and the prince says that he finds both her looks and her intelligence to be attractive. He asks to buy Aoife once again, but Seika refuses, however, he says if Aoife is willing, he will not stand in their way. Seika goes on to tell the prince he is headed up the mountain to see the dragon. The prince knows that will take a few days, so he thinks it could be the perfect time to make a move. Seika says goodbye to Aoife, and he heads up to the mountain. As Aoife returns to her room, she is approached by Liz. Liz tells her about the land, and how it is abundant with mana. She reveals that she can see the spirits around Aoife and suggests that Aoife must be the descendant of the elves. She tries to convince Aoife to join the harem, but she can only think about Seika. Liz wonders if she is content with being a slave, and knows that Aoife must be aware that Seika is a monster. Aoife is confused at what she means, and Liz mentions how the spirits around Seika seem to actively avoid him, much like how they would avoid demons. Aoife believes Seika is human, since they grew up together, but Liz points out that she doesn't know his mother, who could have been a demon. Aoife insists on believing in Seika, and Liz decides to show her around the harem. As Liz shows her around, the harem is not what you would expect. It's actually more like a school, training young women up to be the future leaders and officials of the kingdom. Liz mentions that the prince's mother is the current monarch, and she is beloved by all the people. 
The prince is worried about living up to her, so he is trying to prove himself, rushing to resolve their dragon problems, and finding himself a bride. Liz says that she has known him since he was born, and vouches that he is a good person, so she hopes that Aoife will stay by his side. Meanwhile, Seika makes it up the mountain and finds the dragon. The dragon immediately breathes fire at him, but Seika blocks it with his barrier. The dragon takes flight and dives at him, but Seika is able to teleport out of the way with his talisman. He opens a gate and summons one of his demons, which lets off an intense scream that brings the dragon to its knees. Seika proceeds to create a fireproof net and binds the dragon. Yuki wonders why he didn't start with the net, but Seika says he didn't want to hurt the dragon by binding it mid-flight. Seika heads over to the nest and finds that there is an egg. Yuki finds it strange, since the dragon should be a male, but Seika mentions that some creatures are able to change their gender and even reproduce on their own. He starts caring for the egg and realizes that the legends about the royal family hatching a dragon were probably true. He starts heating the egg up and thinks that the dragon was struggling to keep the egg warm. Since they know why the dragon became aggressive, Seika thinks it's time to head back, but the dragon insists on keeping him around. Meanwhile, Aoife is brought over to see the prince. He talks to a man named Grud, who examines Aoife as a specimen. Factoring in her education and magic ability, he comes up with a price of what she is worth. The prince agrees with the price and confirms with his subordinate. Aoife is confused at what they are talking about, and the prince takes out a huge bag of gold, telling her she is going to be freed. Aoife mentions that they would need Seika's permission, but the prince insists he is paying so much that Seika would not be able to refuse. He even suggests that he would abolish slavery to force Seika to sell her to him. Aoife tries to refuse, and the prince wonders why she would choose to be a slave, but Aoife says that even as a slave, she is able to choose what she does. The prince's subordinate comes back with the paperwork, saying they need Aoife's fingerprint. The prince becomes hesitant, but the man tells him that Aoife will eventually realize that this was for her own good. The prince has his guards restrain Aoife, and she prepares to defend herself, but Liz creates a barrier that blocks her magic. Using her magic, she cuts Aoife's finger and prepares to get her fingerprint. But at that moment, the dragon arrives, and the barrier is destroyed. Seika appears and apologizes for arriving in such a manner. He explains the situation with the dragon and says that he needs a fire user to help warm the egg. He sees Aoife and calls out for her help. Liz warns her not to go, but Aoife admits that she loves him and the two fly away. When they reach the nest, they are suddenly attacked by the lava tiger. Seika stops it with his magic and calls out for Zekt to come out of hiding. Zekt and his men appear and Seika realizes that they were using the prince to get to the dragon's egg. Seeing that Seika has seen through his plans, Zek decides to get rid of him. He commands his tiger to attack, but it gets blown up by a geyser of water. Seika is surprised, and Aoife refuses to be scared like last time. The tiger attacks again, and Zek sends his men to attack, but Seika uses his white inferno attack, unleashing an enormous blast of white flame that completely vaporizes the tiger. Zekt wonders who Seika is, and he just calls himself the world's strongest mage. The dragon approaches, and all of Zekt's men make a run for it, but Seika captures them all with his vines, and Aoife reduces his book to ashes. Seika praises Aoife, and is impressed that she has even learnt water magic, giving her a head pat. Seika reports to the prince, revealing that Zekt was deceiving him, and the prince has them all locked up. Seika continues to report about the reason that caused the dragon to become aggressive, and suggests that if the prince helps to hatch the egg, the dragon will once again see the people as its family and protect the lands. But the prince is not happy with the solution, thinking that it will be seen as indecisive and will fail to satisfy the imperial court. He asks Seika to slay the dragon, suggesting that since he is allowed in the nest, he could poison the dragon. Seika can't believe what he is asking, and the prince says that he must do it to prove himself worthy to be the next king. Seika refuses, and the prince calls for his guards, saying that Seika is suspected of magically influencing the dragon. The prince goes on to tell Aoife that she is now free, and that Seika is dangerous, but Seika gets in the way, and starts to lose his temper, reprimanding the prince, and calling him a child, saying that he will never hand over Aoife to him. Seika worries that he might have gone too far, 
but Liz starts laughing and tells the guards to stand down. She asks what Aoife thinks about everything, and Aoife once again refuses the prince's offer, saying she just wants to go back to the academy with Seika. Liz tells the prince that he should give up, and she offers her apologies to Seika, who also apologizes for losing his temper. She has a private chat with Aoife, and can see she is insistent on being with Seika. She takes her hand, and gives her some light spirits, which are quite rare, and can be used for healing. Aoife reminds her of an elven princess from the fairy tales, and she wishes her the best of luck. As they head back to the academy, Seika wonders what kind of guy she is into, and she describes him, saying someone that is smart, strong, kind, and a bit of a loner. Seika thinks she is too picky, thinking she may not be able to find such a guy, but Aoife thinks it won't be too hard. Elsewhere, we see a group of devils, fighting against a bunch of monsters. The devils have impressive abilities, and easily destroy the monsters. The devils surround a man, who is shocked they defeated his monster trapped so easily. The boss asks the man to show the way, but the man doesn't trust him. Suddenly, the man's trump card appears, and using his eyes, the boss can see it's an elder cyclops. The boss decides to handle it himself. When the Cyclops attacks him, he easily destroys the weapon. He charges at the Cyclops, who fires a laser from its eye, but the boss blocks it and takes the Cyclops out. The other demons are impressed. They end up finishing off the man, and it seems they are on a mission to find and kill the hero. Back at the academy, Seika tells Amu he wants her to meet his family. She is shocked, and Aoife accepts that he wants to be with Amu, but Seika clears things up, saying he is going back home during their break, and his father wanted to meet the mage that can use every element. Amu agrees, and Seika invites Mabel to come along as well. When he's alone with Yuki, we learn that he isn't keen on going home, but it seems there is someone else that wants to meet them. When they arrive, they are greeted by his older brother Luft. Seika introduces his friends, and Aoife's father Adis is glad to see his daughter. They are suddenly interrupted when Gly appears. Seika worries he is still angry taking his spot at the academy, but Gly almost thanks him and is glad that he joined the army instead. He still remembers being humiliated, so he demands to duel with Seika. Amu steps in to take him on, and Seika says he will duel him if he wins. Their fight begins, and Amu goes on the offensive. Gly slips, and Amu goes for the killing blow. But Gly chants a spell, which surprises her, and he disarms her in that instant. Amu complains he cheated with magic, but Gly says he didn't actually cast a spell. Gly demands to fight with Seika, but before they can, Princess Fiona suddenly appears. Gly is her knight, and she tells him he would lose the fight against Seika, so he calls off their fight. Seika is surprised to see him listening to someone, and Gly introduces Fiona as the Holy Princess, which is a shock to everyone. As they head inside, Yuki wonders what a holy princess is, and we learn that it's not an official title, but she was born from the emperor and a priestess, so she has the blood of both. Alma wonders why the holy princess is here, but she tells them that she wanted to meet her. Seeing that she looks just like the hero from the legends, Fiona remembers a vision that her mother had. She tells them she is staying for a few days, and asks them to accompany her when she goes back to the capital. After she leaves, Alma gets sussed out at how Seika knew she would be here. We see Seika's father in his study, and he tells Adis to speak freely, asking if he is mad that he sent Aoife to the academy, but Adis is more upset that she is serving Seika, because he finds him creepy, but Seika's father says he has been doing well at the academy. They all have dinner together, and the princess strangely talks about being reincarnated, but Seika changes the topic. His father compliments him on his dragon investigation, and his mother tells him to write to them more often. Seika is surprised to hear this, because he has always been ignored by her his whole life. Back in his room, Amu comes to visit, she just wants to hang out, and she asks if he plans on continuing with further studies after he graduates, saying she is probably going to go back to being an adventurer. But Seika remembers the time they were stuck in the dungeon together, and he promised he would go adventuring with her so he plans on becoming an adventurer as well. Amu is surprised he is taking his promise so seriously, but is glad they can stick together. The next day, Seika shows the princess around the town. Gly reminds him they left the other knights behind, so they need to keep the princess safe. The princess holds onto Seika's hand so she doesn't get lost, and they explore the market. 
They try out some of the food, but they start to stand out. As they pass by a construction site, there are logs that suddenly fall, but Gly uses his wind magic to destroy it, and Amu creates a golem to shield them. Seika thanks them for their help, but the princess gets mad at him for not doing anything. Seika ends up getting her a gift, and helps her put it on. The princess isn't sure how she looks, but Seika uses magic to create a mirror for her. Gly thinks his magic is weird, but the princess is happy with the gift. Later that day, Seika finds Gly training hard, and he can see why the princess chose him to be her knight. But Gly says he wasn't chosen for his skills, but for a different reason, revealing that the princess has the ability to see the future. Seika wonders if it's true, but Gly says her mother was an oracle, who saw the prophecy of the hero and the demon king. Seika wonders why he is telling him all of this, but Gly warns him not to get in her way. The next day, the princess looks around for Seika, but using his talismans, he is able to avoid her. Yuki wonders how her ability to see the future works, saying it sounds like his divination skill, but Seika explains divination is limited, using information and tools to gain some insight, but her ability is completely different. As Alma walks by, Seika surprises her from the bush. She just lost to Gly again, and Seika finds this strange, since she should be stronger than him. She mentions that the princess looks lonely playing chess by herself, so Seika joins her. It seems there is no one willing to challenge her, so she asks if he knows how to play. Seika says he is just a beginner, so the princess gives him a handicap, leaving only her pawns. Seika thinks it will be one-sided, but the princess offers him a wager, saying that the winner can request the loser to do anything. Seika is hesitant, so she tells him if the request is too much, he can refuse. Seika agrees, and they start playing. As they play, the princess asks him what he thinks the strongest piece is, and he says that they themselves are the strongest, because they don't fight directly, and they control all the other pieces from the shadows. The princess says that most people would call the king or the dragon knights the strongest, but she thinks that strongest piece are those not on the board. Besides the king and soldiers, there are the masses of people living in the country, she never had the king or knights on her side, so she gained the support of the masses instead, and is confident she will win. Seika wonders if that is what she saw with her future sight, and she is surprised he knows about it. Seika resigns from their match, and the princess wants to gain his support. So he asks her about her true intentions. She says she wants to save people, describing a large hole that children are playing next to. They don't notice it, so they will eventually fall in, so she wants to save them, but she can't give any specific details, worrying that it could change the future. Hearing this, Seika agrees to help her how he can. It's time to head back to the capital, and Luff sees them off. Mabel wishes she could stay longer, because she just got to relax, but Seika reminds her she needs to get back to her studies. They head off, and Seika rides with Gly and the princess, because it's the most stable carriage. Gly is surprised Seika has such a weakness, and Seika watches over their caravan. There is suddenly an explosion, but only a decoy carriage was destroyed. Seika goes outside, and sees that they are being attacked by bandits. The bandit leader orders his men to search the carriages, and to fire their bows at Seika. But Seika prepares for their attack, creating a magnetic cloud that blocks all the arrows. The bandits try attacking using magic, but Seika easily blocks it with his barrier. Gly and his men start fighting back and the princess requests that the bandits be taken alive, so Seika uses his vines, which instantly restrains all the bandits. Seika meets up with the gang, and they wonder why the bandits tried to attack when they had an army, and what they are going to do with them. Seika gets called by the princess, who thanks him for his help. He asks if she knows who is after her, but she has too many enemies to know who it was. Seika wonders what she will be doing with the bandits. But she already predicted this, so she already prepared a bunch of spare carriages to take them back to the capital for interrogation. Seika thinks it could be dangerous if they got loose, but the princess says the bandits will behave because they are waiting for their reinforcements. Seika thinks that makes them even more dangerous, but she says their reinforcements won't be coming, so there is no need to worry. They get back to the capital, and they part ways. The princess thanks them for their company, and she reminds Seika that she will always be on his side. We see the other group of bandits, but it seems they came across the group of demons, and were completely destroyed. They continue towards the capital, determined to succeed in their mission of killing the hero. 
Seika gets asked by the principal to give a welcome speech to the new students, saying it's usually an honor to be chosen, although she knows he doesn't care about it. Seika accepts the request, and Yuki wonders if it's really okay, because it will make him stand out. But Seika says it's not a big deal, and he wonders if he has been playing things too safe after the way he died in his previous life. Although he doesn't regret becoming friends with the girls, he thinks it would be okay even if he stood out. Yuki wonders if he will be facing the coming threat, but Seika tells her it will be easy for him, and no one will even know it was him. We see the group of demons outside the city. The leader Zor, notes that there are no Imperial Guards or high-level adventurers to be worried about, although he senses something that makes him uneasy. He explains the plan to the others, saying they will split up and drive all the students toward the center building, at which point they will slaughter everyone and cause chaos until the hero appears. Zor assures them they will succeed, and all return together. The demons are confident they will win, and begin to teleport into the city. However, when they get inside, they find a red mist covering the area. The demon Ganis notices some students approaching, and he launches an attack with his flames, but as he gets closer, he finds something strange. As the witch Presaria and Lonnie the Beast Tamer explore the area, they talk about how they've both gotten stronger since following Zor. They suddenly notice a student running by, and Lonnie sends his wolves after him. They chase him into the mist, but after a while, Lonnie thinks something is wrong, and he calls his wolves back, and they end up bringing him something strange. As the Ogre King Mutarev explores, he wonders why he doesn't see any people. He suddenly gets attacked, and Mabel appears before him. She thinks he is working for the Merchants Association, but he has no idea what she is talking about. They start to fight, exchanging blows, and Mutarev is impressed with how Mabel can wield her axe so easily, considering her a worthy opponent. He blows her away, but Mabel throws her daggers which Mutarev blocks with his arm. However, Mabel activates her magic, which binds him with darkness, but Mutarev easily breaks free, because he has resistance to all magic. He charges at her, slamming down his club, but finds that she has strangely disappeared. Zor finds himself in a strange location, and Ganis arrives, pointing out that this was not their designated meeting point, but it seems they were strangely guided there, and their other members also arrive. They discuss their strange encounters they had, showing the talismans that they each found. Zor thinks there is something wrong, so he orders for their retreat. However, Seika suddenly appears, revealing that every person they saw was just one of his Shikigami, although he tells Mutarev that Mabel was real. Mutarev can see that Seika is strong, so he becomes excited to fight with him, but he instantly loses his head, as Seika cuts one of his talismans, saying that his resistance to curses was just too low. Zor becomes terrified, but Perseria charges at Seika, activating her third eye, trying to turn him to stone, but it doesn't work on him, and Seika summons one of his monsters, bringing out a gigantic snake. It has an inner third eye, that causes her heart to stop, and she drops to the ground. Lonnie's snake bursts out of the ground, but it's no match against Seika's. Lonnie tries to use his taming ability to befriend the snake. He calls out to it, but Zor tells him to run, but it's too late and the snake eats him. Seika finds it amusing he tried to tame it, but says it didn't work because it has a deep hatred for humans. Zor is in disbelief, regretting that they ever challenged Seika. Using his special eyes, he can see all of his abilities, and that Seika is the true demon king. He tells Ganis to escape with his teleportation while he holds Seika off. But Seika mentions how he is protecting Amu, and Zor is devastated to learn that the Demon King has joined the side of the humans. Zor tells Ganis to spread the word to their allies, and he tries to stall for time. He charges up his attack, but Seika uses his magic and completely overwhelms him. When the dust clears, it seems Ganis managed to get away. Outside the city, Ganis stumbles away, and he can't believe Seika is the Demon King. He gets startled by a rabbit in a bush, but suddenly he gets stabbed in the chest, and he wonders how he got attacked. But we see it was another one of Seika's curses, and even Yuki is a little scared of his power. Mabel comes rushing over, asking about Mutarev, as she worries he could be attacking someone else, but Seika tells her not to worry, saying he has already handled it, and tells her to keep it a secret. Sometime later, the students are having another feast, and Seika wonders what he should say during his speech. He asks Amu how she felt when she had to give the speech, 
but she reminds him that her speech was interrupted by demons, but she would have talked about getting stronger together and becoming comrades with everyone. Seika gets ready for his speech, but there are suddenly knights that interrupt, looking for Amu. She identifies herself, and the knights tell her she is being charged with crimes against the Empire, saying that she slayed a demon emissary, but Amu is confused at what he is talking about, and the knights arrest her. Mabel prepares to fight back, but Seika tells her to stand down, saying that Amu is innocent, so they have nothing to worry about, and Amu is taken away. Seika meets with the principal, and they know that the Empire is trying to frame Amu. Seika finds it strange that the Empire is trying to get rid of the hero, and the principal says she is doing everything she can to help Amu, warning Seika not to do anything too rash, but Seika seems to have other plans, doubting her ability to save Amu. As Seika leaves the office, he tells Aoife and Mabel not to worry, because the principal is working to save her, and they should trust her. However, at night, Seika summons his dragon, who is still disobedient toward his new body. He forces it to recognize him, and Yuki appears, warning him not to go, and suggesting that he should give up on saving Amu. She thinks that if he uses his full power to solve the problem, the country may act against him, and he will end up dying just like he did in his previous life. But Seika doesn't care, saying he will destroy anyone in his way. Yuki notices he is enraged, thinking about his past, and she tells him to reconsider, but he tells her to know her place as his familiar, and he orders his dragon to head to the capital. Meanwhile, we see Alma locked up, thinking about her friends worrying for her, and hoping she will see Seika again, but she suddenly gets a visitor. Seika flies toward the capital, unleashing his talismans which transform, and help him look around to find Amu. He descends into the castle, and is not impressed with their security. However, he is noticed by a guard, who blows a whistle, and a number of archers take their position. They shoot at Seika, but he summons his magnetic cloud, which protects him from all the arrows. They keep shooting at him, so Seika drops two enormous boulders on them. As he continues forward, he comes across even more guards. They ask him what he wants, but he tells them to get out of the way, saying he will spare those who obey him. The guards shoot him with flaming arrows, and Seika is forced to dodge. He retaliates with his white inferno, which instantly devastates the guards. However, the guards keep shooting, and Seika summons one of his demons, which cuts up the guards in an instant. The guards all charge at him, but Seika burns them all with his flames. He eventually reaches Amu, destroying her cell, and telling her he is there to save her. Amu worries he will get in trouble for breaking her out, but Seika tells her her life is at stake. Amu thinks they will clear her name and she will be fine, telling him to go home, but Seika reveals to her she is the hero, so things aren't so simple. Amu is confused, and Seika explains that every few hundred years, the hero and devil king are reincarnated, and she is the current cycle's reincarnation of the hero, and the Empire is intentionally trying to get rid of her. Seika suddenly notices someone approaching, and it turns out to be Gly. Seika suggests that he still owes Gly a duel, but Princess Fiona suddenly appears saying she just wants to talk. Seika can tell she has men outside, but she knows they would be no match for him. Seika asks why she is trying to kill Amu, when the devil should be her enemy. The princess explains that although the hero once saved the country against the devils, but in the current age, the empire and the devils both have armies, and neither sides want a war. So the concept of the hero and devil king are just relics of the past. Seika thinks if that is the case, there is still no need to kill Amu, but the princess explains that the hero's existence could be the ember that sparks a war, suggesting that even the demons were trying to take her out, not to gain an advantage, but to prevent the sparks of war. Seika wonders if he should just let Amu be sacrificed to preserve peace, but the princess swears she is trying to save Amu. She tells Seika to withdraw, saying he won't be held accountable for his actions, and promises to do everything within her power to save Amu. But Seika realizes that she manipulated them since they first met, so he doesn't trust her. The princess reminds him of his promise to obey her order for losing at chess, but Seika refuses to trust her. With no other choice, the princess guides them out of the palace, where she has a carriage prepared for them, recommending they head to the free city of Lakana. As they prepare to leave, Alma thanks the princess for her cloak, because she had visited when Alma was locked up. As they say farewell, Seika feels bad for not keeping his promise, so he decides to make up for it. 
He summons a number of doors, which unleash a tremendous number of talismans, creating a field that brings back everyone that he killed. The princess is shocked, saying this ruins her plans, because she had prepared a cover story about a monster attack, and Seika apologizes, saying he had good intentions. Seika and Amu leave the capital, and Seika thinks that Mabel and Aoife must be worried about them. Amu feels bad about having to drop out of the academy when they were so close to graduating, but they look forward to becoming adventurers. We see the princess sending a letter, which explains the situation to Mabel and Aoife. Seika and Amu eventually reach the free city. They see a commotion, and are surprised to find that Mabel and Aoife are already there, and they are overjoyed to be reunited. But that's where this video ends. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.